Okay, thank you. It was 51 years ago that I set off rather tentatively on a route which has taken me to where I am today. Um, we didn't call it system design back then, we called it uh, electronics. Uh, but the world has changed, 50 years is a long time, and there's been a lot of change. In fact, there's been change pretty well every year in the way on the way and it's been exciting change but one of the things that became apparent to me still a long time ago was in a conversation that I had with a professor Derek and I can't remember his other name from University of Manchester 25 years ago where he said you know we're talking about systems here and I think that uh, that really was a, a little note that stuck in my mind and has been a theme a recurring theme in my life since then more specifically uh, we're talking about systems and their design and their implementation and delivery and so on. So without any, uh, any further talk, I'll move on a little bit. Um, but what it means is that I don't think particularly of uh, high integrity. I just think of things working. Uh, and so I had to go to Wiki, as you do under such, such situations, to find out what high integrity software is. Um, because the, all it says there is the scientific method assumes that a system with perfect integrity yields a singular extrapolation within its domain that one can test against observed, observed results. I liked that definition, actually, because first thing was that it's talking about systems. And, uh, and that's, that's where we are, where we find ourselves again. Um, and so it's not really going to be a surprise, good, <coughs> that uh, I'm going to start picking holes in this. It's not high-integrity software that we're particularly talking about. It's high-integrity systems. And I think I can understand where you're coming from because historically systems have been hardware and software. Um, but actually, again, the functionality is the thing that people are looking for. And it may have been that software has a particularly bad reputation for not being producible, for not being reliable. And the, the, the issue about whether it is actually the, the weakest link is a, is a question which has been asked for a lot of years. And I think we're probably comfortably in a niche on this one. We haven't actually um, consolidated formal methods throughout the design of software. And in fact, it has been persistent um, in a uh, stage of coming next year. Uh, and I think that we've not progressed, or at least perhaps we don't feel that we've progressed to make things better. Whereas in point of fact, I think we've pro progressed a lot. What I don't think we've done is to make perfect systems by, by designing software and persuading those really irritating industrialists out there that they have to do things by the formal method because otherwise they're never going to make these systems work. So I guess, yes, that's what I'm missing. Um, so when, we, when we're talking about that, are we really talking today about a different situation where we've got, actually the software might actually be the strongest link. But we do need to look at the other links because functional systems are the things that we need to get out. Those are the things which will ultimately uh, fund all of our pocket money and our holidays and our um, mortgages. Um, but if we have this as the one strongest link in the system, then we need to, uh, uh, to reflect again. So when we actually say software, are we really thinking about computation? Because I think the answer is yes. Uh, computation is about results, though, not about the implementation technologies. So we have to think outside of the box a bit. So we know what proper computing is. Um, I mean, these days it's been, and indeed probably since, I don't know, 1980s, the computer has always been a big thing in a big room. Um, the, the number of MIPS or FLOPs have, have varied hugely with numbers which essentially don't mean an awful lot to people so you, you get so close to them that you're not terribly familiar with them. Um, what, we, what we really don't tend to recognize is there's a whole other, banch, uh, whole other ba batch of computers uh, which are actually far more numerous these days. We need to ask ourselves, are these actually part of the computational challenge that we're taking on? Now I'm going to go back a couple of years, even before I was born, um, to, to look for a moment at, if you like, computers prior to electronics, because they used to exist. Uh, here we've got Graham's Orrery, which of course, it, um, you can look at it and today say it's a, uh, an interesting piece of mechanics. But actually it's computing. It's computing the, the position of the planets, not terribly accurately perhaps but much, much better than having to sit down and work out mathematically where the planets are likely to be, where an eclipse is likely to be, for example. 
um, or help with navigation just to know where they are. Uh, it did a computation which was good enough for its time. And yes, it had limitations. But actually, the recognition of limit limitations uh, was, was part of the use of the, of the product. Now, if you look at this in, a, in a, a little bit more conceptual time, why didn't they do this using electronics? Well, the answer is, of course, electronics didn't exist in those days. So the engineers and scientists that were creating this thing had to use the technology which was available to, at, to them at that time. The scientists taught, you know, provided the, the basic raw materials and the ideas associated with geared systems, and the engineers turned it into something which was, which was functionally useful. We'll move on a little bit. I love this one because this is the sort of thing that you can do when you're absolutely strapped for technology. Amsler's planimeter. Still in use today. They still do it this way. But this is a mechanical system for measuring the uh, contained volume in an arbitrary shape. And I, I think it's a marvellous thing because the principal implementation of this was entirely mechanical. And yet, uh, it, did the, it did the job that was necessary. It was required to, to determine the volume of an arbitrary 2D shape. And it did a solution to that equation. So it's, it, we cannot say that it's not computation, but it certainly isn't electronics. Obviously, the modern version makes use of electronics, but the, still the concept and the way for doing it is, uh, is identical. And the other thing about this is, even though this one is electronic, it's not absolutely accurate. So is it, is it producing the volume of that shape to n decimal places? And the answer is probably not. Uh, it may be to 1%. But for an awful lot of applications, that's probably all that's required. If you need it higher than that, then you can use another technique. So if we look then at computation as a simple model, it's essentially enumerate some phenomena process it in some way and, uh, and, and produce an output, an output which is meaningful in a context. Um, inevitably, state and time are implicitly in this, although we tend not to think of them when we do the calculation. Let's just say that if you can't do the calculation quick enough to be useful, then it's not actually useful calculation. Uh, so the, the time may be, if you can do this calculation today, that will be very nice because I want the results tomorrow. Um, and the state, um, we've got to assume something about the starting conditions on all, on, on, um, on all computations, whether we realize it or not. Um, again, moving, moving smartly on. And so are accuracy, reliability, and cost. So it matters if you're going to use, solve that equation for um, weather, let's say, that depending on your, your particular um, interest in the weather, then you can obviously accept certain degrees of accuracy or not. If you're going to take a plane and fly it across the Atlantic, it's very useful to know exactly which way the wind is blowing. If you're just going to decide whether to have a picnic outside in the garden or not, then it's not really so important. It can be a little bit inconvenient, but it's not classed as the end of the world. So accuracy, reliability, and cost are also parts of that equation. So really the equation is a little bit more complex. Um, I call it STARS. And all of which, when it comes to doing a computation, are architected. They're part of the solution. If you're going to have an effective solution of that algorithm, then you have to give consideration to all of those, and you have to balance, balance your system to do it. Exceeding the need always, almost always costs more. Generally, as a good guidance, if you provide more than the system needs, then you're just paying money for it, and you're not actually producing something which is competitive. Uh, of course, if you're not in a competitive environment, um, uh, there could be, I could argue that military government type contracts tend not to be in a competitive environment, but having said that, of course, it's international competition that we're talking about here. If I have to use a, a bomb, then I want my bomb to be more reliable and make a bigger bang than yours. Uh, and so I think that even in that situation, there is a cost and a competition element. So technologies and methodologies just offer options. And the particular collection of those things which you put together is a successful one or is a failure. So I can produce a solution to this computation and somebody else can produce a solution to, the uh, to an, uh, an equation. But if they are not uh, competitive in the other aspects, these non-functional aspects, 
then one of them will succeed and the other one will fail, even though the answer that they give will be the same. So it's just to, to, to bear in mind that the, the, the answer is not the only thing we're pursuing when we try to solve that equation. Now I'll bring this one up because I think pretty well everybody knows what Moore's Law is. Um, doesn't matter what your background, what your environment. Electronics changed the computation game. And it tended to mean that we all stopped thinking that any other form of computation existed. It suddenly became electronic computation. Briefly, it had a, uh, an affair with valves on its way to transistors, but the transistor and the integrated transistor dominate the world today. Now, although Moore's law is well understood, what we don't really see is the fact that ARM was introduced in 1991. ARM we think of as a little company which has been around only recently. But actually, the integrated circuits that we're designing today, thanks to Moore's law, are roughly speaking 20,000 times the capacity that they were when ARM was formed. Now, what do we know about something which is 20,000 times as big as, uh, as it was before? Well, probably the most um, immediate observation is you can't use the same methods to design that thing when it's 20,000 times bigger than it was when it was a small thing. Imagine designing a house versus a small town. You can't use the same methods just to design a house when you're designing a whole, a whole town. There is more, more required to do, especially if you're required to do it in the same, broadly speaking, the same time scale and with the same, fine, uh, the, the same resources, the same number of engineers available to do it. Now I use this, this is a 1999 figure and I'll come back to it because the second line is, a, is an important line, but I'll come back to that one later on. But what does that mean? I mean, this is uh, 2012 NVIDIA's Tegra 3 processor. This is the sort of processor that you might have inside um, an early um, iPhone. It's not, because this is in, uh, NVIDIA's, but I don't have a similar die shot for the uh, A4. You see, we're talking about a few processor cores, but the main thing I wanted to, to illustrate here is you know, when you start to delve down into this thing, you still can't see an awful lot of detail, uh, although we're very, very much closer. And you don't really start to see the detail until you're very close indeed. Who can spot the transistors there? Well, actually, there's three of them there. Now, we're talking about a billion transistor integrated circuit here. We've got three transistors. Look at what's the dominant thing in that picture. It's the interconnect. Transistors are easy. So a billion transistors means all of this interconnect for each one of the transistors, basically, throughout that entire circuit. The, designing these things at about the billion transistor level is a hugely complex operation. But the other thing is, look at the quality of the, uh, the aluminium tracks on there. It's been etched away, so otherwise you would have insulation on, on here which would spoil the view. But basically... These are the tracks. These are the connections between one track and another track, which is down there. There's one, two, three layers of metal on this particular illustration. Now, they're just tracks. They're very physical. Look, they've got bumps on them. The edges are not absolutely straight. Uh, integrated circuits are not perfect. They're pretty good. But remember, there's a billion transistors on this. That's a thousand million transistors. And here I've drawn a picture of one. One of these contacts doesn't work. Does the device stop working? Actually, one of the big problems you have is you have no idea whether it stops working or not. Because a lot of them turn out to be soft faults, which are difficult to see from the outside. Again, looking at systems. Okay, this is perhaps something that you're more, more familiar with seeing. But of course, if I'm interested in the weather or interested in flight movements, I'm not actually talking to a system when I sit in front of this thing. I think I'm talking to that box. I'm talking to the screen which is immediately in front of me. You are familiar with the idea that that interface is pretty dumb. That the actual compute engine is somewhere out there. Uh, indeed, it might, you, you get the impression that you're the only person using it, but it might actually be quite shared. Uh, so where the bounds of the system are is often a very difficult thing to say. But again, we can say when it doesn't work. So it brings me to two, two faces of computing today, which, um, which I kind of like. There's the invisible part, and this is the invisible part. 
As most people don't see these as computers, they're just part of the infrastructure. They don't see how important they are, it's, uh, it's just that they've got to work. You would go to hospital, you are really not interested if the scanner isn't working, you want to know whether you're okay or not. When you go through the security gates, when your power is available, when you communicate with people, the robotic assembly, even the cup of tea, the, uh, the provision of the logistics and the maintenance of the systems which give you water, the ability to heat it, bring tea from various parts of the world, uh, having been processed, and coordinate the materials which go into the biscuit is a huge activity which is, if you took away computation, this invisible computation would fall down around our ears. These are largely unrecognized computational challenges, but they all need to be dependable. Mm, dependable. The other hand is probably a lot more visible, but these are not really considered to be computers. But these are everywhere. These are the things which people definitely value. They all consider them essential. You, their lives would stop if they couldn't get at their games machines, if they couldn't take a picture with their smartphone, um, or indeed if the washing machine broke down. These are essential into most people's lives, uh, not really recognized as being computers or computer systems at all, but they're big dollars. And we mustn't miss that one, because these are major revenue in earners, not only in the sense of the businesses which are providing the company, the technologies, but the businesses that use those technologies to help themselves, to make them more competitive. <clears throat> I bring this one in because I love the camera and I've got a couple of other slides that I use about it, but you don't get the benefit of those today. But back only 10 years, this thing, this camera, which is actually a, uh, a system for enhancing human memory, had no electronics in it at all. They had a, a small meter in there which was able to give some idea of the illumination, but you'd hardly call that electronics. It was electrical, a photovoltaic cell and a meter, a meter movement. Today, it's all electronics. It's a computer, pretty well from just behind the lens to the memory card. It's a computer. Um, but the other thing about it is all those things too. Uh, optics, analog electronics, sensors, transducers, mechanics, micromotors, displays, discharge tubes, plastics, metal and glass, and actually the last but one item there is one that I quite like. It wouldn't actually be possible to make this thing if you didn't have robotic assembly. You couldn't make it economically, but today you can put these things together because you have systems which enable them to be manufactured. So an essential non-listed part of this product is the system under which it's created, the actual manufacturing process itself. Of course it incorporates ARM, otherwise I wouldn't have illustrated the point. Um, again, what it's doing is it's doing that calculation. The input, however, is an image. And the output, well, I wonder what the output actually is. Because you can't look at an SD card and say there's a picture on there, and yet there is a picture on there. So what it, what it is, is it's actually electrons. So the, you're storing electrons on a card, which you later are going to be able to read in some sort of display mechanism. Now, I guess that that means that the system, which is the system for taking photos, has a lens at the input, and it has a VDU display at the output, but probably more than one because that image is going to go to lots of places. And computing the process, um, part of which is done optically. It's very useful to be able to create a, a 2D map of a 3D world using a lens. You hadn't really thought about it like that, but it does. It represents a 3D world on a flat plane. And I think that that is a, a significant challenge in itself. And it's a, uh, the, uh, the variable focal length is also an interesting one in itself. How many of these technologies could you take away and still end up with a camera? And that camera? None. So which is the most important then? In many ways, the most important technology is the one you haven't got because that was the one that stops you from being competitive with other providers of cameras in the market. It's many technologies seamlessly cooperating to enhance human memory, seamlessly cooperating. When you pick up that camera, you don't think, have I initiated the software correctly? Have I reset the hardware? 
you know, it, it works. And the only thing you know is you pick it, pick it up, you point it, you twiddle the lens to get the picture you want, the image that you want, you press the button. It happens. Technology becomes invisible. And because it's invisible, people are not terribly happy to pay for it. What it means is that the hardware and software aspects of this are really just means to an end, not an end in themselves. Now, things happened in the past, and this, if you want to call it, I guess is my era. Um, it's when the, where people had mainframes and there wasn't many mainframes and there wasn't many people who had them. Um, but the, what tends to happen is we, we kind of assume that because they're yesterday's technologies, they've gone away. Well, a lot of you know that they haven't gone away. They're still there. Relatively speaking, the numbers are not, are, have gone up, but they're not, they've not gone up hugely. The thing is, they haven't gone away. So similarly with mini computers, um, personal computers and desktop internet. The thing that happened along the way was the volume of each one of these became the thing that you noticed. The other ones just moved into another domain. Now if you look at it oops, from the point of view of human population, it gives you an interesting pointer here. Because that's the population of the world, um, or the population of the universe as far as we know it. Uh, it's not very much different. <laughs> the, um, the thing about it is, about here, 2005, uh, what was that, 2010-ish, 2015, um, the world population and the size of these markets intersected. Which essentially means that we're selling more than one of these things to everybody in the world in a numeric sense. The Internet of Things, which people talk about, is going to be selling a thousand of these to everybody in the world, or more. Now, in this area, let's just say, if you're, um, if you're designing products which are going to be in this mainframe area, then you can't ignore the technologies which are being used up here. Because this is where the volume is, this is where all the money is made. It's up here that the technologies are being, de are being defined and, uh, uh, and, and characterized, which will ultimately become the suppliers into this area. Unfortunately, it also means that whereas technology was the driver back then, consumer has become the driver right now, and the domains of the, the, those um, technologies have moved away from being professionally defined to being consumer defined. So it's the consumer today that's deciding which technologies we need to get and how they need to work together, not the profession. So don't get the idea that you're sitting there at your desk and the whole world is waiting for you to come up with um, the, your, the results of your deep thinking. Because you are actually just providing something which, as far as the consumer is concerned, is invisible. It's a problem which has already been solved uh, and therefore, you know, they're not worried about it. They're certainly not prepared to pay for it. And if you're an academic, then be very careful here because unless you can justify whatever it is that you do in a context which the consumer can understand, then ultimately you'll find your budgets are cut because the consumer will say, this isn't important, it's a solved problem. We already have systems. We don't need people to be working on reliable systems. Our systems are reliable enough. They don't realize that 20,000 times increased capacity in the lifetime of ARM actually affects other, business, other aspects of the, uh, of the business as well. So old markets are still there, but they don't drive the technology anymore. So what's inside some of these platforms, just to give us an idea? Because most people have the idea that inside things like a smartphone there is a chip. Well, actually, there's around 20 chips. Um, and they come from all sorts of different people. Samsung, Skyworks, Wolfson, Maxim, ST, Broadcom, uh, Intel, Murata, Invensys, Yamaha, Broadcom, NXP, Maxim. Oh. ARM isn't on that list. That's a little bit odd, isn't it? Uh, ARM is in there, but we're not one of the providers of the chips. In fact, in that one, which is the main processor chip, there are eight 32-bit CPUs. This is, a this is a 2015 slide, incidentally. Yeah. Um, eight uh, big CPUs, four small ones for lighter tasks, and nine Mali cores. So we're already talking about a pretty big um, heterogeneous system in that chip. Now, there's other chips in there as well. ARM 
is probably in, there's around 30 cores, 30 ARM cores doing processing somewhere in one of these other peripheral devices as well as in the, in the principal uh, device. Now obviously this is a complex system. <clears throat> but of course we're not only looking at the electronics. Inside that processor, the, the core processor, there is a technology. So this is a, another technology. This is a section through that main processor uh, package. There's the processor die looked at from the end. And above it, there are two memory die inside the same package, quite invisibly. So it just looks like one integrated circuit. The two memory dies are connected together and ultimately connected to the processor. The processor, of course, is connected to the pins underneath, and then that sits on top of a printed circuit board. It's not easy, and it's not, if you like, sexy technology, but actually it's a very important part of putting a system together like this is the ability to do stuff like that. There's other areas. Putting a camera in a 3x5mm three, three cube, putting a, uh, a vibration motor together, which is only 5mm long and 2mm diameter. Uh, these are all technologies which go into and enable this thing. Look at the memory chips. This is a uh, uh, smart memory from Samsung. It's got up to, what's the number, 16 die stacked on top of each other inside the package. And that package is only 1.4 millimeters thick. It just looks like a standard integrated circuit. It's not easy technology. Believe me, it's not, e not only is it not easy, but it's not perfect either. Now they don't mind that all of these dies don't work because it talk you talk to it through a smart interface. You talk to it through an API. The API is also the way you talk classically to a hard disk. The hard disk wasn't perfect either, but you, you, you ask the system to store away a block of data, it stores it. You don't care where, the only thing you need to know is that when you want it, it can be provided. So the management system on this puts the data that you are required to store in the parts of the memory that work. It doesn't worry too much about the other bits, as long as there's not too many of them. It can legitimately say that there's 128 gigs inside that package because it's got a few gigs spare. And mostly speaking, it's all right, mostly speaking. But that you've got that technology in your smartphone, uh, about 32 gig, 64 gig. And in fact, the latest I noticed yesterday, they were talking about 512 gig from, I think it was Samsung. It was in the news yesterday. Now returning to this graph, however, 1999, it's the last time anybody produced this graph and it came from the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon. And it showed data points going out to around 1999, obviously the rest of it was going to be future at that point. But essentially they were showing what would happen if Moore's Law continued, which it more or less did. But they don't really dwell on this other one and that was how much effort it took to make these chips. And back when ARM was formed, it was around 100 person years of effort, which was manageable. You could live with that, you could put that together, you could make a chip, you could make a system on it. But actually the view outward was going to be that the productivity of the tools were not actually improving fast enough to keep up with Moore's law. So the numbers therefore, these were the linear extrapolation of the increased design challenge, which was, which was getting out of hand rapidly. And then there was the verification gap, which nobody was thinking about in 1999, but it became a big, a big issue further down the line. It's not just design this thing, it's make sure it is what you expected it to be. So something happened, and the thing that happened was reuse. Greater than 90%, as much as 99% of tomorrow's product is today's product. Now, it doesn't really sound very exciting, but software is part of implementing that, but it's also in hardware as well. But it also means that you have got to design today's product based on the work that other people have already done in the past. And it also means there's precious little time to go back and re-engineer anything. Only if it's broken do you do that. <clears throat> so, I'll have to bring a business context into it briefly. Um, businesses have to be competitive money-making machines. They sell, sell things that customers need. They can't afford to do anything else. We're now in a globally open market and competition is the thing that keeps us on our toes. And if you're not on your toes, you're out of business. So you want to be part of the game, you have to be in the game. So companies increasingly focus on their core competencies. They do only what they're good at doing and they leave the other things to other people. 
Um, they avoid commoditization by differentiation. Commoditization, despite the fact that it's good for driving the price down, is bad for almost every aspect of business because it puts you into, co into a direct competitive situation where the only outcome is reducing your price and reducing your quality because those are the only things that can ultimately be sacrificed. Functionality cannot. It's got to work. If it doesn't work, it's not a product at all. So new product development then is just a risk to be minimized. It's not a positive thing. You've got to do it to stay competitive or to differentiate yourself, but you've got to do it as cheaply as possible. Hmm. So technology just enables options, just enables. It's not the most exciting thing out there in the product world. And new technology may cost more, including risk, than it delivers in product value. And if it doesn't deliver anything in product value, then it's not on the parts list, virtual or otherwise. Another design, of course, uh, just cause, causes extra costs, causes extra problem. Business can't afford it. Good enough is enough. And uh, it's why you only get, uh, you work your, your little socks off and you only get well done at the end of the day because that was what was expected from your role. Uh, you don't get uh, accolades until you've done more than it's expected. And the same thing applies in the products. You don't get thanks from customers for producing something which is more than they need because they don't need it and they're not prepared to pay for it. It does mean, though, that their, the reuse of their technologies becomes an economic necessity in other markets. Now, how much of this is real? Apple produced this list of suppliers back in 2011. There is 159 tier one suppliers on that list, and of course ARM isn't on there, because we don't supply directly. We supply knowledge and know-how which goes into the chips which, are, which ARM incorporates, amongst other things, into the products that they're creating. So there's probably around 10 times that number of uh, tier two suppliers, and on tier two suppliers you would find ARM. Um, there are lots of things, lots of technologies, lots of things that people are contributing because they're focusing on their major skills, contributing to the design of these complex electronics. Tens of thousands of engineers worldwide. And of course more than 90% of the technology is reused and, it can't, and we can't avoid that because we need the productivity. So designer productivity has become the limiting factor. Um, the customer expectation from the billions of available transistors is huge. I mean, customers say, wow, we could have this and that and the other integrated. The marketing people say, we could have this and that and the other and something else integrated. And you can do it all inside a single chip. And you can do it for £10 because that's all I've got available. And you will be able to have it out by next year, won't you? Because that's when the market window is. That's the sort of pressure which is, which is provided, if you like, by Moore's Law. The designers, the system designers, have just got the task of implementing it. Believe me, going back and doing things better, waiting for things to happen optimally, is not an option. So despite this, commercial technologies will be used in systems on which people depend. So the, the inclusion of commercial-based technologies and methods will get used in high-reliability systems. There's nothing you can do to stop it. The alternative is just too expensive. So what does ARM do? Very briefly, ARM, of course, we sell CPUs, but I'm not going to tell it like that. What I'm actually going to say is ARM is delivering reuse-based productivity. That's what we're actually doing, is we're enabling people to reuse more and more of the work that they've done before and also work that other people have done outside in the rest of the world. We're providing an infrastructure in which all of those things can come together and it enables people like Amazon and Tesco's who don't have their real own electronics or system design groups to have products which have got their name on it and which work for them in an optimised way. Um, but it does mean that you know, core to what we do are CPU cores if you like, an engine which brings a, um, uh, an abstract system design methodology, let's call it C, uh, to, a, to a world where it's going to work in an embedded context. And we have a range of processes from 50,000 transistors to around 50 million. So there's a lot of scale in there, but they're both, they're both called ARM. Um, and we put them together, or we help people to put them together, in complex systems. So this is one, two, three, four quad-core combinations. Those are 
heterogeneous, um, whereas, uh, sorry, those are homogeneous, whereas if you start to include the CPUs, GPUs, and DSPs, which are also part of this system, many of which come from us, um, are, are definitely now a heterogeneous overall system. This is an implementation that we give to the people who want to license this, these technologies of the system that they can create. So they take this implementation, use on the available tools that they need, and they customize it for what they want. They may not want as many cores, they may want some different cores than the A15s, they've got their own bit of logic that they want to add on to it, and indeed that can be quite a substantial coprocessor or anything like that. But they take that as the basis of a design. So that's the thing that people are using. Of course, we can't just provide that as a hardware template. It's got to be supported by the design, software design environment. It's a system we're after. And so these are not on their own. Libraries, OSs, ports, utilities, and hundreds of co-developers. There are 900 licensees of ARM technologies and interfaces and standards and so on that we produce producing million, millions of potential developers. So when somebody thinks about making a smart electronic product, coming into ARM is actually quite a good idea because this is a huge network of people who are already uh, working together to help to design the complex systems that you need. But all of these people are independent. These are businesses who are all in business for the value that they can get out of it. They're not there principally to, uh, to support this design environment, although they do realize when the product is in the market and is selling successfully, that's where the money comes from. So they are aware of it. It's very real, though, that these things which are, if you like, built on a tower of sand, they work. You don't really have much problem with the reliability of your smartphone, despite the environment in which it's being come together. And yet, uh, it shouldn't work. There are so many reasons why it shouldn't work. So the, probabl the probability of this, this quantity of things happening is such that we've, we really have made um, the impossible possible. But to be honest, we don't know why. There are more reasons why it shouldn't work than the reasons why it should. So, whoa running out of time. So I'm going to skip a couple of things fairly quickly. I'm not going to talk about that, but the exercise is of design is principally creating a model of what you want, a virtual model of reality, and mapping it onto a platform. Traditionally this platform has been a fixed platform, a CPU, a major processor. Today, even the platform is part of the design equation. Uh, so is software inherently undependable? I think the answer is yes, uh, because of the design methods. Formal methods are undoubtedly better, but nobody can make the whole th system um, practical because the platform, which includes other software, has to be, on a, it has to be imperfect. Moving on. Is hardware any better? Because this idea that hardware is perfect has come from somewhere, but the answer is no. Actually, hardware is, uh, is fairly imperfect. Of all of the things I've talked about, there are many reasons why it shouldn't work. Uh, so why do they? Well, they work because there are uh, a, an awful lot of factors that we don't really understand. Weak transistors still produce integrated circuits that work. They just work, don't work quite as fast, but if you're not actually running it at full speed or at full uh, lowest voltage or at highest temperature, then you don't notice. The major thing that they do is it does impact reliability. You don't know how long it is before one of those weak transistors is going to stop. Uh, traditionally, transistors have lived forever. These days, they don't. They have a finite lifetime. They actually wear out. But CMOS logic is very tough, and memory, um, which is more sensitive to variation, much more sensitive to variation, also has inherent uh, repair mechanisms built in, so they're much more, they're much more robust. But the, good th the, the news about all of those is, whereas they are more robust, it's very difficult to say how robust they are. So you don't have a perfect situation, you just have a more robust situation. And there's a lot of imp imponderables that we haven't included. Um, and so, generally speaking, we should be very... Uh, surprised when any of these complex systems work. 
So despite this, they do yield, so we must be using unknown safety margins in our design and in our technologies. And unknowns, well, they're unknown. And if you're trying to produce a system which is high integrity, then an unknown is just unacceptable. I want to settle uh, a little thing which existed here in the past. I hope it's in the past. There is no difference between the way hardware and software is designed today. They both use languages, they both use compilers, they both have all of the imperfections of, the, of one in the other. Hardware can be implemented with errors, just like software can be compiled with errors. And the, uh, the view from above, whether it's a software world or a hardware world, uh, depends hugely on the work that other people have done, not only today in different companies, but in the past as well. It all mi migrates forward. So we can't design them right, we can't make them right, we can't keep them right. Uh, it all gets worse as process geometries shrink, we know that. And yet they do work. And yet that gives us the impression then of being naysayers. So if we stand up and say, well, you can't possibly make systems that work, then the market says, well, here we are delivering systems that work. Don't tell me about what we can't do. We can do it. So you get, all that happens is you become known as the harbinger of doom. So you're just saying that something isn't possible when demonstrably, as far as the consumer is concerned, it is. So dependable on undependable is a fundamental thing that we're going to have to face. We've got to produce de dependable systems, there is no doubt about that, but we have only got undependable components on which to build. System level dependability is what matters, components and subsystem dep dependability is poor and will get worse. And productivity demands say we must use these, there is no other option. So the only place to implement system level dependability then on an undependable platform is at the top level. There's no, nowhere else that you can do it. Having improved functionality and dependability on the lower levels is good because it helps the top level to do it. But the top level has to handle this. It has to, ha it has to look for not only expected behavior, but non-expected behavior as well. You can't just design for functionality anymore. You've got to design for non-functionality, for other aspects which are important parts of it. So the conclusions then. Systems are what end customers buy. They expect them to be dependable enough. Um, they don't really care if their anti-lock braking system doesn't work when they're not using it. Commercial components will be the building blocks for dependable systems. Get over it. I don't know how we're going to do it, but that's the challenge. The system knows what the system wants. Only at the system level can you understand what normal behavior is, and what abnormal behavior is. Therefore, you have to examine that. And it's only that that knows what the correct failure mode is, or how, how, how do we escape from this situation that we're in when a failure happens. It's only the system knows that. Meanwhile, systems that people depend on will be produced. I guess you've seen both of these recently, but they are enough to scare me. Okay, thank you very much. Indeed, thank you.